Welcome to Public Finance Conversations, our third one. We are very fortunate today to have Mays Kekish with us. Mays has quite the resume and has served with several different districts, but she started off on the private sector. And in the private sector, she served as an accountant for school districts, but then moved on to work for a very charming district, Paris Elementary School District, as the uh, Director of Fiscal Services. After that, she went and worked for Riverside County Office of Education. For those of you who are not involved in the school business on a regular basis, uh, every county has an Office of Education and they provide services and oversee the fiscal responsibilities of the districts uh, within that county. And Mays can certainly give us more detail on that as we go through. But following that uh, Riverside County Office of Ed experience, she then went for Beaumont Unified School District and that was followed by Moreno Valley Unified School District and then followed by Riverside Unified School District. Um, so many districts within Riverside County and really working with one of the largest ones now. And then that she's also during this time served on multiple boards, the Alliance of Schools for Cooperative Insurance, ASCIP, Riverside Area Rape Crisis, Joint Education Transit Board, and presently serves as president for school business executive. So, Maze, you serve in quite a lot of different roles. Uh, did I capture the essence there? Yes, you did, Adam. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for doing this with us. I, I, I'm very excited about this one. And then prior to getting into the professional uh, uh, world, uh, Maze uh, graduated from Cal State San Bernardino and has um, a background in accounting. So Maze, you started off in the private sector and then you transitioned into the public sector. Tell us what it was like. What does a school district accountant do? So um, when I graduated from college, I, I knew I wanted to do accounting, but I did want to do it at a firm um, that specializes in like banks and big audit companies, to audit big companies. And, um, and I started to have my kids in college so I have two sons that were so young. And after I graduated to look for a job, I was so happy to just land any accounting firm jobs. And it was a small um, firm that was uh, based in San Bernardino. So I just accepted the job, not knowing exactly what they do, but I knew they did auditing, but I didn't know exactly where they specialized. Um, they ended up by coincidence being specialized in school districts and nonprofits. So 90% of their work was in school districts. And so that's how I landed in school districts accounting. Um, and I was uh, auditing and the senior auditor for many districts in California, uh, throughout California, up north, like Ravenswood, Santa Monica, Malibu, Saddleback, um, many of the Riverside County and San Bernardino districts. So that's the work of an auditor for a school district is to wrap up at the end of every fiscal year the financial statements and have them be certified by a CPA firm. So that's a requirement by law every year. And, and that's what I did for approximately three years before I joined a Paris elementary school district. So you got to see a lot of different school districts and how their end of the books go. But then you found this charming district, Paris elementary school district, and you went and joined them. What, what helped make that leap happen? So audit in general, whatever organization is a very time consuming job and seasonal. So it has a very intense season. So for school districts, the season starts somewhere um, at the end of August to September 15th, where you have to wrap up an audit report to the state. Um, you have to submit it to the county and then to the state. So that season, you have no life between September and December 15th. So you love it. You're traveling all over the world. It's exciting in the beginning. You find out where Starbucks is and all the nice restaurants around in the, in the area that you go. The problem is there was no family life. So in the last, in the three years they did the audit um, services, I really was literally four months out of the year was outside of the house with two little kids, two little boys. and. I'm gonna give you an example. One year, I had to have my husband on Halloween 
draw a map for me in order for me to know when I'm going to catch, catch up with them and do the Halloween trick or treating. So he actually, I get home not knowing when I'm going to get home from a district with the traffic and having to finish an audit. And I think that year it was a Friday for Halloween. And so we, I ended up coming home and driving that route. And once I found them, then I joined them on the trick or treating to finish. That's how I was able for, um, for me to join my kids in some of the activities. So it was very, very tough on the, on two boys that were like one and a half and three at the time. And so, um, I ended up being offered, I was a senior auditor for Paris school district and, uh, it was like a family when I get there and I spend the week with that group, I felt like family and with the superintendent offered me a job when the position was available. Um, I was ecstatic. I was honored and I felt like this is it for me. This is how I can give my family back some time and some quality of life. Um, and so that's how I accepted that job. Really, I loved auditing and loved meeting people every day, but having to have a district uh, position gave me the, some of the priorities back in my life, which is my family. Oh, and, and a little, it, pretty close to home, being in Paris um, there. But wow, wow, trying to track down your kids on Halloween, I think that, that I could see the desire to want to make a change there. But I think most would argue going to a chief business officer job down the road isn't exactly the most, uh, uh, the time uh, flexible that some are looking for. But you, you, it sounds like you found the balance because then shortly after Paris Elementary School District, you went and worked for Riverside County Office of Ed. Um, would you mind sharing that experience with us? Yes, so uh, you're right as far as um, selecting a director of fiscal services. And it, at the time there was no assistant suit position, so it was a CBO job at the same time. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't probably, um, I didn't know enough about it as far as responsibilities and, and having to take so much time out of your family life. It still was balanced enough. Uh, much more balanced than audit life in my in my view, um, but it is a big responsibility and the, the stress and the um, and the um, uh, level of of responsibility just goes with your home. So you, it does take a lot of uh, of your time thinking, probably, but not necessarily. But being present as uh, physically with your family versus not being present and not being um, uh, healthy enough as far as uh, rested to be spending time with the family. So um, the county office education at the time, I was participating as a CBO from a small district on many different committees. And one of them was transitioning the financial system for the whole county. Um, and it was, I don't know if you remember the transition of Galaxy for the Riverside County. I became um, really involved in it and loved that work and was able to connect and make connections with the county and have relationships with many of the staff there. And so um, when the position was offered, when Vince Christophos left that position to go to Redlands, I called Vince and I said, what does that position look like? I'm, I'm really intrigued and interested and um, I would like to take, um, take a chance and apply for it. And so we met and he told me all about the position and that was so interesting for me. I think the most interesting is that it would complete the picture that I had as a CBO for a small district, um, as far as their financials, the picture that I had as an auditor uh, from the private sector to looking at the financial statement, it completed the oversight side of that for a CBO. So now I'm, I got so much more familiar with the internal operation of the County Office of Education, but also the um, oversight side of, of having to oversee school districts and give them advice and give them support. So that was really, um, Probably, if I were to say, it was the most exciting time. It was so rewarding that it was. It felt like you're a consultant, like in the audit world, and you would meet so many people, and you feel that you're helping them all the time. Versus the audit, when the auditors go to a school district, they cringe. They don't like the auditors coming in. But when it's a county office and they know it's supportive role, um, it was. It gave me an opportunity to continue the a piece that I loved of the consulting world. And so that, that was my most exciting time, I think, in my whole career. I love everywhere I've been, but as far as knowledge and the, the fast um, learning curve that I had to go through, that was the, the years that I spent at the county office. 
Well, it sounds like you got to combine both worlds. You know, one thing that I always like to do is I like to go after the auditor on my presentations because both our subjects are considered dry to a lot of people, right? But the auditors, they are, they are facts. I, I can at least tell you how the market's doing. There's some homes that sold over here, something like that, where the auditors come in. So that's always nice for me to come in after them. But before you, I, there's a question I had wanted to ask you about the small districts. And one of the things I've noticed about small districts is that CBO role serves a lot of different roles. I've been on the phone when a CBO ha had to go put out a bus fire. It puts me out, a, a real fire. When I say put out a fire, oftentimes you just mean emergencies. This was a legit hot fire that he had to get a fire extinguisher and put out, right? Another time, the electricity goes out in a school kitchen and the, C the CBO says, Adam, just stay right here. She goes in and turns on the light somehow, right? But then we get back to talking about call features, term of bonds and things like that. And it's always amazed me how CBOs have to transition from one thing to the next, and it's never more true than small districts. Have you ever had to put out a bus fire? So Adam, this is so interesting because you're absolutely right. You have to go through so many things um, and you have to shift so quickly. I wasn't, I never really put out a fire, but I want to tell you about an experience I had in Paris School District. Um, there was one year where the school district received a letter and the letter was a threat of anthrax and that was received by the receptionist so the, the department of health services had to act quickly and that district had to undergo a whole strip down for every single person in the district office superintendent to the clerk stripped down to their birthday suit had to be washed and sprayed to, to be disinfected. All of their clothes had to be washed in a specific way. And the, the healing of that incident after that took a long time. When you're part of a family, I told you Paris was a family. That's so that's, right. I think, what got them through uh, is the fact that they treated each other as family and they had the bond that got them through this. But Another district might have not been able to overcome something like this. And many people will probably have to leave the whole district in order to kind of forget that incident. But I just wanted to, you to have that as an example that this happened in a small district like that. Now, I wasn't there that day. I was very, very lucky that I wasn't part of that team that day. But I just, I just thought when I learned about that, what they had to go through and then the relationship building afterwards with that image, it was just, it's just, it was so overwhelming i just just to say the least but yes. that's another example that happened at a school district <laughs> that certainly sounds like it well i'm glad you weren't there that day they got a little bit of a pass on that actual that in, yes. in, in there so from transitioning to uh from riverside county office of ed to beaumont and for those who may not be that familiar with beaumont beaumont has been growing rapidly for probably two decades now and so there's a very small district the oversight role, and then now a rapidly growing district that Maze is working on. Do you mind telling us a bit about Beaumont? Yes, yeah, so Beaumont was another special district. Um, it was about 10,000 in enrollment, and it was, it felt like it was the right next step for me, because going from a small district like Paris, five schools, um, to a district medium-sized like Beaumont um, was a big jump, big learning curve for me, and there was uh, really the two challenges that I feel like they were the most important for me to jump with that team and be able to bring some solutions to where that district was going through that rapid growth. But in order to prepare for that, previous administration have um, made decisions to use, for example, many of you might be familiar with facilities rules while you're planning the schools you need to use tentative maps in order to do the projection of the growth, right? Now, those tentative maps, maps at the time from the city needed to be approved tentative maps. The previous uh, administration had great relationship with the city and they were um, on regular communication. So they always talked about and shared information that helped the school district be ready. Um, but the mistake that the district did is they used the tentative map maps to actually apply for 
uh, school facilities funding from the state. So when I got to the district, that was already identified and it was a huge uh, dollar amount that we needed to put a payment plan for. It was over $10 million. That got me right away uh, in connections with OPSC. And if you remember Ms. Louisa Park at the time, uh, she was the head and I needed to come up to an agreement to help the district um, make payments that are affordable over a period of time and not jeopardize the rest of the facilities funds that they had to have to go through in order to accommodate the growth that was coming. So that was my first challenge. And I, I feel like we were successfully as a team and it wasn't in every district. When I say I, I know I use sometimes I, but it's really not just the CBO. It takes the whole team to support the, the any initiative. And in Beaumont, uh, in particular, I just, I can say that it was co always called the dream team. So Dr. Carroll, um, Steve Harvey, and Dr. Latham, and I, I felt like there was so much that uh, needed support in Beaumont as far as the district goes, and between that dream team, they made it happen. And so one of them is accomplishing that payment plan without jeopardizing the rest of the facilities funds. The other um, challenge was they have, uh, they've had a very tough time passing bonds. There was a, a large community base of uh, senior uh, communities, and they will not pass a bond in Beaumont. For some reason, there was a great conservatism when it comes to that. And so our job was to uh, create the education and, and give the community the details and the, and the data behind the need for that bond. And so that, again, that green team uh, compiled um, the right consultant for that community as far as the campaign manager, and they went out and did that education for a full year in order for them to pass the bond. So that was my first experience in passing bonds. It was really um, a very intriguing process that, that very strategic. You have to learn so many different things throughout that process and to get to be able to accommodate all of the needs, all of the interests, whether it's a community interest, the district interest, the student's interest, the parent's interest um, in the event that we um, were out to try to educate the community. Um, usually, you know, Adam, more than anybody, that it's so hard to pass a bond while you have a project like a stadium in it. Because usually communities don't pass bonds when you have athletic facilities in it. They want the, just the core program. <laughs> for that, for that um, community, we found out quickly through surveys that athletic fields for the high school was so important to the community. So the ones that did the actual going around getting the support from the community was the football team because they were getting, they were telling the community how this bond was going to help them. So that was the second challenge in Beaumont. And I just feel so proud of the whole team and the community. And now the facilities that they have are like state of the art facilities that we ended up, um, you know, they ended up finishing after I left Beaumont, but um, if you go back to them, you can feel the community's uh, interest in it. Well, Maze, there's a common theme of districts that you go to work in because Moreno Valley is the next one. And one of your first things there was helping with the general obligation bond measure. And for those who may not know what, uh, when we say a bond or a geo bond, we're talking about general obligation bond measures in California the ones that we're typically talking about here are 55% 50, voter approval. And essentially what happens is should you get that approval, you're able to put on the tax roll taxes to repay bonds, but you need that voter support to be able to do that. But Reno Valley, you did it again, or you and the team did it again. I, I think Moreno Valley was exactly the reason why I was asked to apply for Moreno Valley. If you remember the late Nick Ferguson, he was the interim superintendent at the time. And, and he actually, call me and and it was I, I believe it was because of the work that we did in Beaumont with regards to the education and how we were um, strategic about the process of going out to the voters for a measure and and when I got that call I was so happy in Beaumont again we were making a great difference from even not just the facility side but on the educational side and on the achievement side so it was there was so much work yet to be done um, but he insisted that I am needed in, in Moreno Valley at the time. And so um, I, I respected Dr. Ferguson so much that I, 
could not say no. And I went through the process and I was the selected candidate. And again, two major challenges that were on um, my desk when I first got there. Well, I knew about the measure that they were interested to pass a bond. Um, but the other piece that I did not know, they're the self-insured district. And they, at the time, uh, we were going through just out of the recession uh, or like not out of the recession in the main, when we found out about the recession and we started to go through it. Um, and they were in the hole for the self-insurance fund. And, and it's risky as you know, for self-insured districts, you just don't know your claims from one year to another. Um, you know, just few group of uh, claims could really hurt the, uh, the fund of the self-insurance fund. And so right away, we needed to solve that. And that was the first thing that we had to do. And then similar to Beaumont, Marino Valley needed to have an educational process for the needs of the facilities before they go out for a measure. Um, Adam, one of the things that I feel like any district, it's so important to have the right team and the right relationship between the partners that are going to work on any initiatives, whether it's the budget with the bargaining units and the right relationship with the bargaining units, but it's also in something like uh, actually passing a measure with the with the voters and get the support. It takes the right team, the right team in the finance, the right team of the cabinet, the right team on the board uh, to collaborate together on their interests to accomplish that. So um, between Beaumont and Marina Valley, I've learned so much to how to strategically build that relationship and get the team together. Great. And then you go on to Riverside Unified School District. Just, I have to say, just a wonderful district with a one very special high school within its boundaries. Do you mind telling us about Riverside Unified? Well, Riverside Unified is really, um, I felt like a big, big step for, for me. Um, it was the county name for the district. It was the second largest district. And on top of that, I was actually following a great leader in business services. So when Mike Fine left Riverside Unified School District or was about to leave, and I was interested in that position, it was like a dream job for me, I think. Uh, back when I was in Paris Elementary, when I first met Mike in one of the CBO meetings, it was Mike Boyd was the chair of that group at the time. And I felt like, oh my gosh, Riverside, he's the CBO of Riverside Unified School District. One day I would love to be in Riverside. And so I had big shoes to fill, literally and figuratively, because I'm only six and a half shoe size. Shoe size. <laughs> so, and um, having to follow in Mike Fine's um, steps was, was already going to be a challenge for me. But his support and the support of the board and the great superintendent, Dr. Hansen, I felt like I, I arrived at a district that I feel like I can serve and also maybe end my career there as far as um, working for school districts not in my career in uh, business overall, or maybe going back to auditing one day, but um, I felt like this is the district that I'd like to be in. It was already one of the largest districts, and I felt like I can also influence the state and the county level from that seat, because uh, Riverside uh, made a difference when they spoke or when they send a letter to a lobbyist, uh, through the lobbyist or to our uh, legislators, they actually listened and they had a great reputation. So I felt like I can actually learn more and, and give more in Riverside. Um, just like Beaumont and Marina Valley, Riverside was also, if you remember, looking for uh, to go out for a measure. And um, the, when the, one of the pieces about Riverside was, it was a very conservative community. They had not passed the bond for 15 years. And it was gonna take a lot of education and a lot of data to, including your very special school, which was one of the neediest schools, Poly High School. Um, we needed to convince the community that we need a measure. And so that, is, that was, again, one of my first projects to work on and getting the right team, including the team on cabinet that leads that effort and to go into a successful, uh, passage of uh, Measure O now. Great, and it, certainly very fond of, the, of that one high school. I'm glad that it has very nice facilities now. And, um, but your husband 
also, a, obviously, work, he works in a community, but he owns a small business. Can you tell us a bit about that and him and anything you want to share there? Sure. So my husband um, has a, an auto repair shop with a smog testing facility in San Bernardino. In order for any CBO to be successful, I really think they need the support system at home. And I think the fact that my husband was so structured and was in control of his business uh, as far as he doesn't have to account for a boss or have to answer for a boss except his wife, um, it was really um, important for me because then he can actually be there for the, for the kids. And then my mother-in-law lives with us, so she was able to be our third parent in the household. Um, and I'm just feeling so fortunate and blessed in order for, um, for, for me to succeed in leadership positions in school districts. It would have never uh, been possible without my husband's support, really. And I, he's a very nice man. I had the opportunity to meet him. The first time I met him was when you were getting a very special award as Administrator of the Year in Sacramento. Would you mind just sharing with us what that meant to you? Oh my gosh, I was on cloud nine. I was so honored and humbled that I actually got the state um, AXA award. And I, I just want to go back. I know it sounds cliche, but it, it is really a team award. It's just that one individual is being recognized, but it's, it, I was recognized for the team effort of um, the team at the district level in Moreno Valley at the time and what we went through and the team at the AXA Business Council. And that's the only reason why I actually kind of felt like I got both the best worlds when I got the Region Award and then I got the AXA State Award. It was the connection at those teams. The, the work of the AXA Business Academy, uh, Business um, uh, Council at the board level of AXA and what they influenced at the state level as far as um, law with regards to school districts was really, I was so proud of, and that's, I believe, what, um, what made the board recognize me as a CBO for that year um, and gave me that honor. But it's really not Mace Kakish, the CBO, individually. It's really the teamwork of both sides, the district level and the state level. So, But I was so proud. I was uh, feeling so uh, honored having my own table and having my own escort superintendent escorting me to the table. It was really, really, really nice award. I wish it for everybody. And you also have two boys. Can you share with us about them? Yes, I have uh, Murad, which is, uh, he's 26 years old. He's a uh, marketing and communication director for, no, um, coordinator for the Riverside Health Systems uh, Communication Department. And uh, Majd is a teacher for math teacher for San Marino uh, Unified School District, San Marino City Unified School District at Cajon High School. So uh, very proud of raising very productive citizens. Good. You know, Maze, one thing I think I've learned from you over the years, or uh, many things, but this is one that stands out to me, is a lot of parents, when you ask them about their kids, it's a checklist of um, uh, things they've accomplished. And one of the things I've learned from you, I was sitting across the table from you once and I asked you how your family was, and you told me about kind of some of the things they're doing, but how that was impacting them and you. And it just felt, I could feel the love pouring out, but it wasn't necessarily like, let me tell you about all the things my kids are accomplishing. And I've really tried to adapt the way I describe my interaction with my kids based on some of the things I've, the, the approach I've learned from you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm very proud of their work. and. Very proud of them all the time, but um, I do feel like our number one thing is to serve the, be a productive citizen and serve our communities. Well, Maze, as we start to wrap this up, one of the things that um, I really respect about you is your ability to quickly get to the bottom line and focus on that. But a lot of people that do that then lose that human connection to it. I never walk away from a conversation with you without understanding that that's a very important part to you. So you get to the bottom line, but you also keep that human element. Are these things that you try to piece together or is it just who you are? How did you get to be able to do that so well? Um, so those are actually, I'm gonna take them as compliments because um, being direct sometimes is looked at harsh. Um, and what you described earlier 
uh, as being direct and getting to the bottom line um, in most circumstances is called Kakishing in Riverside Unified School District. Um, how I got there was really two different trainings. Um, I'm very fortunate to have had um, superintendents or cabinet level that really invested in professional development. And in my area, leadership is an interest and I've always uh, tried to engage in training that would make me a better leader. So two trainings that really impacted me. I've, I've been through so many, but the ones I wanna talk about that really uh, gave me that directness was the crucial conversation training. Um, that was, at the time I was at Riverside County Office of Ed, and I, I invested in that time, and it was valuable to my personal life and to my professional life, to how to really engage in conversations that are gonna, be, that, that are gonna make the difference. Whether you're talking to your high school student at the time, my son, and the crucial conversations you have to have with your kids, or you're talking to the superintendent of the County Office of Ed, and the crucial conversations that needs to take place there. So I believe that I attribute some of the skills I've learned and I've had, I have a lot more to go, is to that specific training when it comes to being direct, but yet being um, very methodical about it. The other training that I think is impactful on, on my life is, and it meets the interest of my life as far as personality, is Arbinger training. And when you talk about the human factor, Arbinger is the right training to make you um, get, have the skills to be able to treat people like people and not like objects. And so when you really go through that methodical training, you start to realize some of the things that we have, the biases that we have, the um, treatment that impacts people, whether it's negatively or po of positively, the way you treat people. And so that training, um, and Riverside Unified has invested heavily in it. Once you know a little bit about yourself, so you go through surveys about strengths and you find out what's your strength, what, where is your least strength, uh, and then layer it with the Arbinger training, it, it really makes you a better, a better leader. That's the least I can say. It gave me enough to just really believe in it that I want to be a trainer of the trainer now, and I'm trying to learn more about how I can bring that to teams and use it um, with our teams as a trainer. Great. Well, I think that's very helpful. And I've read that Crucial Conversation book, but it sounds like there's another one I can read to combine and hopefully I achieve some of those same skills. One thing I failed to mention before I started wrapping this up was the number of boards that you sit on. And is there one of those that you want to highlight and has a special spot for you? Um, yes, actually. And I believe when you select a board to serve on, you really need to select one that you're going to give you're 100% and I know it's hard to do, so it's not always the 100%, but the Riverside Area Rape Crisis Center um, was one I was introduced to many years ago. Um, and it's through my connection at the Riverside County Office of Ed. And since then, it's been a passion. It's been, a, after learning about the advocacy that that center does and the impact they have on the victims that go through that, uh, I felt like, the only way I can contribute is try to raise funds to give them more um, funds to be able to do what they do at the better level with better tools and better supplies for their uh, center. And so that's probably has the most special place for me. Um, and I continue to serve on that board and continue to try to raise as much funds as possible for Riverside County. So that is the Riverside Area Rape Crisis Center. It's, it's yes. That's right. Um, well, Maze, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us. As you know, we've done several of these uh, public finance conversations where we're trying to get people from different sectors of public finance uh, field. And uh, when you said yes, I was very excited because I knew it'd make for a great interview and you're someone I really admire. So thank you and um, look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you, Adam. Good luck on your series. Thank you.